I know, I know, don't adjust your YouTube sets, which is not a thing. Where the flub is Gareth? Well, he had to sort some things out this week. So he gave me a call and he flew me in, which also isn't true. So for one week only, I will be upping those downs when it comes to NXT, which obviously stands for next. In case you don't know, my name is Simon Miller. Welcome to What Culture Wrestling. This is known as the finger of power and it gives the good bits an up and it gives the bad bits a down, which today we are going to do for a pretty big episode of NXT because we had a flipping world title match and Karrion Cross and Finn Balor whooped each other's ass. So let's get ready and let's up those downs. We really did tie into the whole importance behind this Karrion Cross versus Finn Balor 2 title match at the start of NXT because we had these videos and we had people talking. They wanted you to believe this was the most integral event that had ever happened in the history of the world. And it must have worked on me because I was like, you know what, when that match is over, I'm just going to lay down until I'm dead. I mean, what else am I possibly going to be able to do? Before we did get there, though, our first match was Ember Moon and Shotzi Blackheart taking on Raquel Gonzalez and Dakota Kai. And they had a very, very fun tag team match. We were also told the winner of this may get a future tag team title shot, which means they are going to do that because why else would they set? And of course, in the early going, Gonzalez was whooping everybody's ass because she's the NXT Women's Champion and you want to be able to get that across. However, when Ember Moon tagged in, she was kind of Raquel's equal. And once again, you could just kind of see where this was going, especially given the aftermath. I think soon we are going to do Raquel versus Ember. And that will be good. Gonzalez was also really pissed off because Ember Moon had tried the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment around about 682 times, which is why she went and got Dakota Kai in there. And this is when the bad guys took over. Shotzi Blackheart got back in there eventually and she was beaten down pretty quickly. But then we cut to a commercial and when we came back, she had miraculously recovered and she tagged in Ember Moon. I have no idea what happened there. Maybe somebody caused the distraction. And while I joke, that is what Dakota Kai did in order for them to get back on top. But you could see this coming a mile away. They were always going to lose. And eventually Ember Moon and Shotzi Blackheart hit that slam cutter thingamajig. And they got the one, two, three. And I was going to be like, oh my gosh, they're going to challenge for the tag team titles. But actually, maybe they won't. Because afterwards, Gonzalez demanded that Dakota Kai held Ember Moon in place as she just walloped Shotzi Blackheart from here to Timbuktu. I mean, she powerbombed her into the ring post, she powerbombed her into the barricade. This was like watching a kidnap movie where the mum isn't able to save her daughter. However, I do suppose this means that Moon will be desperate to get revenge and to get her hands on the world title. That's always nice. It adds layered to the story. All of this pretty damn good. Pete Dunn was then taken on Bobby Fish in his comeback match. And my word, this was just tremendous professional wrestling which actually could have been the theme of this week's nxt and kind of the theme of every single week's nxt either way up they just absolutely wrecked each other including at one point dunn just stamping on bobby fish's face because who needs a face in 2021 and when he was done he then went after bobby fish's arm because of course that's what kept him off television for the past 78 years he was continuing on this assault until fish got him on the outside and chucked him into the barricade but then he procrastinated too long he got back in the ring and he got booted in the face but then he was busting out an exploded suplex honestly this was the definition of back and forth wrestling but it really pulled me in they then decided hey why don't we just knee each other in the skull for a while so I hope both their brains are all right. And ultimately, they were just trading and reversing and transitioning before Pete Dunne manipulated some joints, although Bobby Fish still kind of got out of that one. But he ended up in the bitter end position. Pete Dunne hit it. And honestly, we need to see this one again soon. I can't believe just how smooth, but also violent and brutal it was. However, only Lorkin jumped in afterwards to try and re-break Bobby Fish's arm before officials broke it up. So that's the direction we are now going in. And I was a little bit tempted to start a counter because when he had two matches and both matches had post-match beatdowns, but I thought that would be a little bit unnecessary and would kind of make me a dick. So I haven't done it. Mercedes Martinez cut a promo next as well, saying that she is going to climb back up the NXT ladder and become the world champion. And then this got super creepy because after she left, the camera kind of panned out. And we saw that Boa had just been watching her. And a small note for anybody that is watching me, don't just hide in the shadows and stare at anybody. I did soon forget about it, though, because we then had a video featuring Hit Row. And these guys, my word, they are going to be big. Because it's just such a good act. And if you can believe it, 
They actually feel cool and they actually feel like badasses. I don't want to cast too much shade on WWE here, but sometimes they swing and a miss. That is not the case with these guys. And I am pumped to see what they're going to do. It was then time for Mercedes to follow up on everything she had just said. And she did that because she was basically in a squash match with Zayda Ramia. And sure, Zayda got a few licks in there. But ultimately, Martinez chucked her off the top rope. She hit the air raid crash and she got the one, two, three. And of course, because it was a special episode of NXT, we then had post-match shenanigans. Because as soon as she was done, all of a sudden the CWC started having smoke pouring everywhere and the colors went red and when they went blue. And when everything had settled down, Mercedes Martinez looked at her hand and a mysterious spooky tattoo thing was on it. This of course was courtesy of Tian Sha. And as I've said time and time again, I'm all good with goofiness and shenanigans and gaga being in my wrestling, but that doesn't always mean it floats my boat. And when it comes to this one, it's just not floating my boat. I do think they'll have a great match when they finally do clash, which will probably go down at In Your House. But yeah, I'm watching it. I'm like, well, it's well presented. And I guess it's kind of all right. But I'd rather we just did something serious with these guys. That's why it's getting it down. I then have to contradict myself as we had more nonsense. And I had the time of my life. Up. And this was mostly due to the Million Dollar Man. Now, yes, I love that character. I can't help it. And I'm also amazed that Ted DiBiase can do that laugh on cue and on call still perfectly after all of this time. I mean, I would try it for you here, but I won't because it'll be mega cringy. But believe you me, off camera, I gave it an attempt and I suck. Cameron Grimes was out first, though, and he just wanted to know why DiBiase was treating him like scum because he looked up to Ted DiBiase, the Million Dollar Man. He wanted to be like him. And now his dreams have been crushed because his hero is a massive dick. DBRC then in true wrestling fashion came out and said, whoa, slow down, kid. The reason I've been treating you this way is because I see a little piece of me in you and I think you've got massive potential. So it's like when you're in school and you fancy someone. So your great idea is, well, why don't I chuck my pencil at the back of their head? And how did that get on, huh? It didn't work. He still hadn't really made up his mind, though, which is why all of a sudden LA Knight flew out here and he was like, look, Ted, don't team with this jackass. Team with me because together we can become, I don't know, the million dollar men. They should call them that. Grimes then had enough of this because he felt like he was playing second fiddle to the situation, which he kind of was. So he told LA Knight, I'm going to kick your ass to the moon. But then he like turned his back on LA Knight. So LA Knight was like, okay. And he beat him up. It also ended with the million dollar man standing over Cameron Grimes and going, ha, 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 as his music played. So I think we are actually teaming up Ted DiBiase with LA Knight. I'm not 100% how I feel about it, but I also feel very excited because this could mean the return of the Million Dollar Championship and it's definitely going to mean the return of Ted DiBiase. All of these things ticked my wrestling box. Not a euphemism. Everything with Indy Hartwell and Dexter Loomis followed and I couldn't quite believe what I was watching. She was looking for Dexter backstage when she bumped into Everise, and these two were just so ridiculous. They were like, you want to fight? Let's have a fight. Before Drake Maverick calmed the situation down and said, Indy, why don't you go into this room? That's where I last saw Dexter. So she went in there, and I'm not lying to you, it was the most creepy room you've ever seen in your life, because there were just drawings everywhere of heartache and sadness, and one when Dexter Loomis had illustrated him with a knife going into his heart. And if you've seen that episode of Alan Partridge, well, it was even weirder than that. Hartwell also seemed upset about this, and I don't know why. She should run away and ultimately call the police. Honestly, this is a really weird and a really bonkers storyline. And if you're not going to do anything else today, just go and Google the pictures and look at them. You'll be terrified and you're probably going to have a nightmare. Frankie Monet was then debuting in the ring next. And do you remember a few weeks ago or months ago, whenever it was, when everybody was so mad about her name. And now here we are and we've all just got used to it. Seems like a nice lesson we could learn. But look, this was all right up. And this was always going to be a squash because that's exactly what Monet needs right now. Although it was a little bit strange because it meant we had two squash matches on the same show. But she was taken on Cora Drade, who once again had a little bit of offense but ultimately got hit with the glam slam. One, two, three, and we were done. She looked good though, and if you weren't aware of her before she got to WWE, this was a good showcase of, oh man, I wonder what she's going to do next. So it did the job that it had to do. I don't really have much else to say about it. The Grizzled Young Veterans were then responding to a promo that Tommaso Ciampa and Timothy Thatcher had cut earlier in the night, and the long and the short of it is that they all hate each other, and when they do have their match, maybe somebody dies. 
I suppose it could happen. Walter was then on my television screen. And when Walter is on my television screen, one thing usually happens, and that's that he gets it up. And it was just a pre-recorded video, but he was like some kind of army general here, talking to the rest of Imperium, but he just comes across like the most intimidating dude ever. He doesn't want any more nonsense than only destruction will do, and I cross all my fingers that one day he just has a mini run on either Raw or SmackDown. I know he's not massively interested in it, but I am, from a fan's point of view, he just comes across like he could kill you by looking at you in the wrong way. And we all know about these chops. So once again, you cross everything too. And maybe in a few months it will happen. Or we'll realise that this doesn't mean anything. And who the flub came up with this? Bronson Reed was in next. And who doesn't like this guy? As has been the way over the last few weeks, he cut this big promo about how he is the North American champion. His 14 year journey has finally peaked. And that now no one's going to be able to beat him for this belt. Until, of course, he turns up to work one day and Triple H says, hey, tonight's the night, and he gets booked out of this. Somebody was always going to interrupt because, of course, it is WWE, and I was kind of surprised when it was Santos Escobar and Legado del Fantasma. Because Santos, well, he hasn't really been on a winning streak as of late. In fact, he's lost a lot, but now he's decided, hey, I want the North American belt. He also can't relate to any of this nonsense that Bronson Reed is talking about because while he had to work his way to the top, Santos was born a champion, which is why he's challenging him for that thing, and of course he will win. It looked like his cronies too were about to jump Reed when MSK all of a sudden ran out to make the save. And being the massive wrestling nerd I am, I was like, oh man, I bet we're going to do a six-man tag at some point. And then William Regal proved me wrong almost instantly. Because straight afterwards we were told that instead we're going to get these guys taking on MSK for the tag team titles. But also, we're going to get Pete Dunne versus Kyle O'Reilly versus Johnny Gargano to see who the new number one contender is going to be for the NXT world title. Now, there's a few random names in that mix, but also, how good is that going to be? Once again, I'm going to have to go and lay down. So because of this, and because of the Bronson Reed stuff, which I did enjoy, well, I'm going to give it an up. And this all did lead to our main event, and Finn Balor, man, here he is sitting in my hand, in my palm. What a tremendous professional wrestler he is. I genuinely believe, put him down, he could have a great match with anybody. He could have a great match with me, he could have a great match with you. If you somehow turn a giraffe into a human, he'd have a great match with that too, even though it doesn't make any sense. Carrion Cross more than held his own as well. This is getting it easy up. It started pretty evenly before Balor started to work on the champion's back, but that just kind of wound Carrion Cross up, and he started suplexing Balor as many possible ways as he could. And somewhere in the distance, you knew that Scott Steiner was just smiling away. Which is not true, because Scott Steiner does not smile. It kept going at a frantic pace for ages before Carrion Cross found him like stuck between the ring apron and the actual ring himself, and then Finn Balor just started to boot him as much as possible. But ultimately, this did not work out at all, because Carrion Cross then grabbed Finn Balor and he power bombed and just threw him right into the barricade. And honestly, we've got to give a shout out to Barricade on this evening. He was there for pretty much every spot he was told to be there for. There was also this awesome part in the ring when Finn Balor went for the sling blade, then went for the pinfall, but Carrion Cross kicked out at one. And it was kind of from that point on, he was all like possessed Carrion Cross. Because something weird happens in his head. Carrion also hit this pretty badass Razor's Edge, but that didn't phase Balor too much because he then launched into this terrific comeback, which ended with this crazy dive where he almost landed on his head, but it did not affect Carrion at all because once again he just grabbed the challenger and chucked him through the announce table. So the whole story here was kind of like no matter how much Finn tried to fought back, it was ultimately pointless. And then the ending sequence to this they must have done 57 moves, each of which was reversed until Finn Balor went for the Coupe de Gras. Damn it, he missed. We then went with this finish that WWE is kind of obsessed with lately because Karrion Cross did lock in the sleeper. And although Finn Balor was able to fight out of it once, he was not able to fight out of it twice. And of course, because he couldn't breathe, he passed out. The referee checked his arm. He was gone. He had no choice but to call it. Karrion Cross retains. This was absolutely top stuff though, and I'm kind of hoping that Dunn wins that triple threat match next week, or whatever the hell it's going down, so he can go into a program with Karrion Cross. And as a smaller side to end, Adam Cole wasn't on this show at all, and the rumors recently is that there's going to be some call ups from NXT. So do with that what you will. But this felt like a really good episode that was finished by this main event that NXT has been building up for weeks, so I was more than satisfied, which means overall, 
as getting it up. Now, please leave a comment below and let us know what you thought about last night's episode of NXT. Then like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Go check out whatculture.com to read the ups and downs article to get even more opinions. Then you can also come say hello on social media and click a video around my head right now. And you can stay on the channel and continue to be sports entertained. My name is Simon for What Culture. Thank you for joining me as always. And yes, I'll be back on Saturday where we're upping those downs for Smackdown and Dynamite because Dynamite got moved. Couldn't even say the name. Thanks a lot, world. But really, I'm looking forward to a crazy day of wrestling. I will see you then.